Hello all this morning. Hey, congrats. We made it through a month of this. We are week four of 12. This is an awesome march towards like the end of the year uh, through this section. And today I feel so blessed as we get to review and uh, discuss uh, the key comforts of the Lord's Supper for us. And I was just thinking this morning um, that you, you can't review things like this enough when this is the way God, God looks to communicate in such a clear and personal way for the feeding of your soul on a regular basis. That is such a blessing. And we, we really are, are, are doing well to have this time dedicated to growing in our um, appreciation for Christ's body and blood in Holy Communion. So uh, that is our topic this morning. And uh, as a little bit of an activity or primer, maybe you see there, we're going to be discussing this. Um, there's a three-step process I want you to do in the next minute or a minute and a half. The first is, get your pencils and pens ready. What are the three things that form the Lutheran definition of a sacrament? It's a sacrament because of this, this, and this. There's three things. See if you can write them down, then share with a neighbor and use your powers combined, and then we'll, we'll talk about them together. Three things why it's a sacrament. We don't say prayer is a sacrament. We do say baptism and the Lord's Supper are sacraments. Why? Things that form the definition of a sacrament in the Lutheran Church. My mic still on? Yes, it is. Okay, good. No Googling. Are you Googling? I see smartphones. I'm just kidding. Okay, let's do it together. Who's got one? Who's got one? Helps us to find a sacrament. Who's got one? Linda? Okay, there are earthly elements involved connected to the Word of God. There's an earthly, uh, visible elements tied to something invisible with the Word of God, the promise of God. Else, Lance, what else? The forgiveness of sins. These are usually numbers two and three. The forgiveness of sins is given. Not just a, a symbol, but uh, the giving of God's forgiveness. And Luther would say, wherever you have forgiveness, you have new life and salvation. So the, those three all, always usually go together. It gives forgiveness, new life, and salvation. Uh, what's the first one? There's God's word. Jesus instituted it is probably the closest thing. Jesus, Jesus gives us the instructions, the uh, parameters. Jesus tells us to do it and tells us what to do. So Jesus tells us to do it. There's a visible element and um, tied to the word of God and it gives the forgiveness of sins. Three things. Awesome. Let's look at that at the Lord's Supper and uh, we're going to start with the Luther video as usual. So if you have a scene or a comment that you jot down, I know that's kind of, there's a lot of sentences in a row, but if there's a thought that strikes you and you want to share it afterwards, feel free to make note of that, okay? Let's 
hope and pray this functions. Oh, there it is. Second slide. I was, I was getting antsy. Okay, here we go. Luther wrote early in his work that the New Testament taught only two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism had remained unchanged over the centuries. But the Lord's Supper was not being practiced as Christ instituted it. The Catholic Church saw the Lord's Supper as a sacrifice for sin, a work to be done to earn forgiveness. Speakers are blown. It isn't a work. Neither one of the sacraments are works that I do for God. They're totally gifts that God gives to me. Within the Protestant movement, there soon developed two different views of the Lord's Supper. Reformers like Ulrich Zwingli saw the bread and wine as a symbol of Jesus' body and blood. Luther believed the body and blood were actually present in a mysterious but very real way. This rift created a concern among political leaders who did not want to see a split between Protestants. And so this special meeting was held in the city of Marburg in 1529 with the goal of reaching a compromise between Luther and Zwingli. For Luther, the issue had a very simple solution. Trust the words of the Bible. At one point, Luther wrote out the relevant scripture in chalk and covered it up. Then he lifted the tablecloth and revealed what he'd written. This is my body. Here is our scriptural proof. You have not yet moved us. He was adamant about holding on to what God said, what the scripture said, because it was Christ's last will and testament. When he said, this is my body, that's what it was. We must turn our eyes and hearts simply to the very word of Christ, by which he instituted the sacrament, made it perfect, and committed it to us. For in that word, and in that word alone, reside the power, the nature, and the whole substance of the sacrament. Test. There we go. Okay, this is an intentional slide, by the way. It's not the projector gone wrong. Um, something you wrote down from the video clip. Short and quick. Anything you wrote down and want to react to? Please, Erica. This is, my body. this is my body. Was huge. The simple, every, every word in that could be, we could, we, and we may spend some time with today. This is my body. A very important statement for Luther at the table with Zwingli at the Marburg Colloquy of 1529. Bob. I can say the same thing, this is my body. Stands out. Clear, simple. Did you catch a little line in there that they said, um, it was John, the, the, N, the NPH president, John um, Braun, saying, um, well, this was, this was clear language. It was Jesus for Luther was Jesus' last will and testament. And I've heard this before, that something that you, you know, at the, at the brink, right before Good Friday and before he leaves and ascension, all this is happening fast, you're not gonna use confusing language. This isn't the time for metaphors or games. This was the time for something clear, something solid, and Jesus is presenting to them exactly what this meal was going to be. And so that's one of Luther's views, is this is serious. This is a last will and testament. This is how Jesus wants to be um, in a special way with us and um, communicative of his forgiveness to you on a regular basis. So it's a, it's a, it's a huge topic. So that is, 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 because Jesus said is, and he didn't pull the punch. He left it out there for our, our full enjoyment of it in the Lord's Supper. This is my body and this is my blood. 
sorry for a tangent there, but catching the spirit of this is huge. <laughs> what else? Please. Okay, as if there was a sacrifice, uh, um, that there was some approach uh, to calling this Mass or um, the Eucharist has an arrow this way. In fact, we have a couple of terms for the Lord's Supper. Sacrament of the Altar, Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, and you've heard of Eucharist. Eucharist is the one, the one term for the Lord's Supper that, tend, that kind of looks this way more than the others. Because Eucharist means give thanks. So if you're giving thanks, um, it's directed upwards. And that's kind of the, um, not to say it's the whole spirit, but that is the spirit of that title, is to emphasize the giving thanks. Jesus gave thanks. We give thanks. And the, the sacrament is also um, sort of like a re-sacrificing of Jesus in a, in a crazy way um, in, in the teaching of the church in Luther's time. So, good point there. Anything else that caught your attention worth mentioning? Probably have to play it again. Lance. Uh, holding on to principles, this is one of the Lutheran Church's principles that we hold on to, is, is the Word of God being the Word of God and all that. And, and even if we're pressured to, to compromise our principles, we don't. So this is a great example. You see, uh, you heard of the pressure to compromise, as Lance brings out. What did, what, what did, what did they say? They did not want to see um, a split in the Protestant Reformation. They didn't want to see another split among Protestants. Just like you and I sort of lament, and I think society does in general, why are there so many churches, and that means nobody knows what's right and what's wrong, and they just all have their own interpretation. Nobody likes the fact that there's this very large denominational tree instead of having, you know, a single vine, or instead of having that, you know, beanstalk to heaven kind of idea. Instead, we got multiple branches, and they didn't want another split or branch off, but what it, Luther couldn't he can't compromise when it comes to scripture. And we are going to spend some really rich um, time thinking about that very table where Luther was there with Zwingli. And that's actually why I have these blotches up there, however blinding the light may be. Should have told Luther to put sunglasses on this morning. Um, but I do want to talk to you a little bit about that. Uh, uh, what did I say? It's in, under the bonus paragraph. Um, at the Marburg Colloquy of 1529, Luther debated with Zwingli over the nature of Christ's presence in Holy Communion. Luther continued to reiterate that Jesus said, and you know how to fill this in, this is. While Zwingli maintained it was a spiritual presence, and Jesus meant to say this represents or signifies or symbolizes my body. We, we do not have any eating of Christ's body and blood, only a spiritual eating of Christ's body and blood. In our Formula of Concord, we'll, the Lutheran confessions talk about two, um, two kinds of eating, I guess you could say. There is a spiritual eating that is there by faith. <laughs> that Jesus gave this to his disciples, he gave this to believers, and he gave it for the forgiveness of sins, and you are, you are given this, and you are strengthened in it, and um, there is a spiritual eating, but that there is also something more. Then we probably can't put the right words on it, but I will say that Jesus' body and blood are truly present, and it's more than just a spiritual eating. Well, let's get into, um, see, if, see if I can communicate this clearly, a little bit of the reasoning going behind Luther and Zwingli. And maybe you could draw a line down the middle of your sheet under the bonus section to kind of put Luther thoughts on one side and Zwingli thoughts on the other. I, I maybe should have done this in your handout, but if you want to do a line down the middle, then you could think about uh, the difference between the two of them. How this comes out is Luther and Zwingli both believe that Jesus was true God and true man. They had this in common. 
Jesus is true God and true man. But what, Lu what Zwingli was trying to say is that in the Lord's Supper, Jesus was present in the Lord's Supper, but only his divinity. Only Jesus' divinity is there. So in the Zwingli column, only Jesus' divinity in the spiritual presence of Jesus, um, only his divinity is there in the Lord's Supper. Maybe it's like um, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them, Zwingli is saying. Jesus says he's with the church. That does not mean that he's like bodily inside of me or something like that. Well, Luther could counter. He, Jesus isn't saying, this is my body and this is my blood when I'm talking about that's how I am with them. This is a very sacramental, special way, Luther would say, um, that, that Jesus is fully present because he says he's present. So he says it's my body, so it has to be a bodily presence. I can't say that it's just a divinity and not humanity. So both of them are getting Christological. And there are probably 12 pages on just this topic in, the, in our confessions to say how Jesus is, is true God and true man, and he is, he's going to be that way for the rest of time. One of, the, um, one of the things that we don't say is represented by these colors. Let's say that the blue is Jesus' divinity and the yellow is Jesus' humanity. They're both true, but what we don't say is that somehow we have some fusion or equalizing or we have like a, a third, like a new thing, like a unicorn. Uh, you know, it's not a horse and it's not a, I don't know what you, anyway, I, I messed that up, okay? Where, where you have like divinity or your humanity or, you know, we had like this weird blend of something new. Um, and we can't say that these two are, are thrust and now Jesus is green. Because if you, if you go that route, then somehow you say that he's not fully human anymore and he's not fully divine anymore. He's fully this new third thing. He's fully a third thing. And he's lost, you know, some of his d divinity stuff or he's lost some of his humanity. He's not both separate. So if you, if you fuse them, the two together or you find a way to, like, mix them up, um, you, you, you would sacrifice so that he's, he, he loses something of one or the other in your theology. So I'm thinking about this, how do you mix the colors together without mixing the colors together? So that he's, the confessions carefully say Jesus is united. He has these two natures are united in one person. And they are united in one person for the rest of time. Maybe the way to say, you know, this, this confusion would be um, that Jesus uh, could, could pick and choose uh, like, like a snack bowl and you're taking the M&Ms out and leaving the nuts and the raisins or something. Jesus didn't pick and choose parts of his humanity and he's left some of his yellowness. He's not really fully yellow anymore. He's become something new. Um, he, that's not true. He is, he's both fully blue and he's fully yellow and he's not green. <laughs> We're going to say this and find a way to say this in our confessions so that I don't lose something of one of the two of his natures. Um, or you could say it's not like his humanity is, is limiting his divinity. We say when Jesus came, he's not making use of his divinity even though he had it all. It's not like, oh, my hand is getting in the way of my miracle working ability or something like that. So this becomes a huge issue, you know. Jesus is not limited. He is choosing not to use what he has. He really has all the blue. Even if he's not green, he's fully blue and he's fully yellow, he's not green. He hasn't lost anything of the blue. He hasn't lost anything of the yellow. Um, and maybe I was thinking of the sand. <laughs> Um, Jesus isn't some blue that like hides yellow. You can't, um, this is the other error that kept crept into the church was that you would, you could slice Jesus down the middle and at sometimes he's acting yellow and at sometimes he's blue. Um, 
you know, as if they were kind of, or he, he just looks human on the outside, like he's just using his humanity as an outer shell, but his divinity is then, you know, and as if, as if he didn't have a will or he didn't have a soul or he didn't have all those things that are essential to humanity. No, he had all of these things. The, the nux, the nux of it, the crux, the crux of it comes um, where you say, Zwingli, the ripple effect is kind of where I'm going here. All of this has a ripple effect. For the rest of time, Luther and our confessors want to say, because Jesus says it this way, that I'm fully God and I'm fully man forever. And wherever I am there, it's me. And I'm not, I don't change in my person. And when Zwingli says only Jesus' divinity, remember this, only Jesus' divinity is in the Lord's Supper, then suddenly I've ripped the blue away from the yellow. And if I rip the blue away from the yellow, do I say God died for me on the cross? Or was that just let's rip the yellow off and the yellow was there at the cross? This has huge ripple effect. Was it, did God die for me? Can I say God was born? This sounds crazy to the ear. Reason says, you can't say God was born and you can't say God died. Come on, think a little bit, Pastor Bondo. But scriptures say that Christ died. And this Christ was the Son of God. And I can't break him up into two. Because he's forever, he's mixed. I'm not going to take all the grains of sand out and unsort these two as if when he died, he died just human died. And it wasn't, Luther says, I want no part of that kind of Jesus, because that kind of Jesus can't do anything for me if he's just human on the cross. And if he's just God somewhere, that's way too much. It's too overwhelming. He must be God for me. He must be God in my place. He must be my substitute. He must be my savior. So it becomes a huge topic for Luther because you're talking about not just what's going on in the Lord's Supper, but who's my Jesus for all time? And you can't rip him apart and say only his divinity is there with me in the Lord's Supper. Uh, so it's a huge Christological argument. Any comments or questions on that attempt to describe the person of Christ Let's go ahead, please, Beth. So basically, we're just logically, we're never going to really grasp it because our minds are too small. And this is by faith. You know, because by logic, you know, your head starts to kind of spin. <laughs> and I get like, well, I don't get it. And I finally come to the conclusion you're not going to get it logically because we're human. Yeah, this goes back to a little bit what Lance said before. He said, you know, in a, in a big way, reason, we've always said, don't forget to put um, the, the, mop, the mop broom in the hand of reason. Reason is always a servant to the scriptures, even though our human reason wants to be the judge and lord over scripture. And this is another case where I may never figure this out like the Trinity. I may never, I, I'm going to come up with a way to confess what the scriptures say. The scriptures say that God, that Jesus was raised to the right hand of God. And Luther will point out, look at all these ways that his humanity has received all the, the full participation in everything of his divinity. He's using it. This is his, our ascension truth is our Jesus, our Jesus, fully God and fully man, is using all of his powers for us at the right hand of God. How would I ever, Luther say, put a limit on Jesus' words with my reason? How would I ever wear the crown and say, I'll tell you, Jesus, where you can be and where you can't be with your bodily presence? So Luther says, this is just another case where I must, I must just quote my Jesus in his serious last will and testament and let him tell the church what he wants to tell the church. I love this. We had communion today. What did Jesus tell you? I'm yours. And I don't want you to just think of me being spiritually present. I want you to know that throughout your life, when you take the Lord's Supper, it's me. And you have all of me. And we're not going to shave it off. 
We're not going to tone down that comfort. It's going to be loud and it's going to be clear. There's a huge, it's a huge rich comfort in the Lord's Supper. I think we have, Nancy, please. Never gave this any thought, but um, so Jesus, as a human, um, he couldn't have sinned because he had um, God inside of him as as being perfect, and, and God couldn't sin, right? Right. Jesus is true God, and he couldn't sin. So, I mean, it's another difficult happen. right. We could say he he's truly human, he's truly God, but without sin. And this is like the, the fun, big thing of Hebrew, the book of Hebrews early on when it talks about he himself shared our flesh and blood because he had to be made like his brothers in every way. And it says in every way, yet without sin. It goes right to that kind of little, wait a second, wait a second. And then you say, well, was his temptation real if he couldn't sin? Does scripture portray Jesus' temptations as real temptations? Yeah. So I'm not going to ration and, and kind of rationalize or figure this all out, but I'm going to say his temptations were real. Jesus was truly tempted, and he had a human will, and he has a human soul. He has all the things that humans have, but he doesn't have sin. And he could live a, a real life under God in my place, under the law, to redeem those under the law. <laughs> he was God. He wasn't going to sin. You're right. So, you know, you kind of run circles around some of this. Good point. Let's now, I think we're ready, let's look at um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. As we dig in this scripture together, we're going to see what, um, how and, and, and in what way the Apostle Paul encourages the Corinthians to think of the Lord's Supper. You have the Lord's Supper's teachings in a number of places. Um, you have it in the Gospels, but we're going to see here that the Apostle Paul says, I have the same apostolic authority. Jesus gave to me what to pass on to the church. Jesus also told me about the institution of the Lord's Supper. Look at um, chapter 11. If your Bible's like mine, page 1151, verse 23. And I've got bits and pieces of the passages up here. Yeah, I do. Okay. So uh, why don't you follow along? And what we're going to do is just have two, um, two boxes or two sections on your handout where I want you to try to track some important truths that you find in these verses. And we're splitting it in half. Um, 23 to 26 will be our first chunk. Then 27 to 29. And just write down some truths that you see reflected in the teaching. Um, you don't have to do that while I read, but uh, we'll give you some time to do that afterwards and, and share it at the table with the group. Verse 23. For I received from the Lord. This is a direct Revelation special to the Apostle Paul. It's not the only time he talks about this. Um, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pause there. Why don't you write down a couple of truths you find in those verses.
All right. Let's just do this as a large group for the sake of time. What are some truths you wrote down from these few verses? Please, Kathy. Okay, you mentioned two, two truths. One, Jesus commands us to do this. You see the command that this would be a sacrament on a regular basis in our lives. So we have the truth of doing this. We have Jesus' command to do it in remembrance of him. Um, so it's something that a believer has to do for, for in, in their life um, for the rest of it. And what else? You said, we proclaim the Lord's death. If you scan the earlier part of the chapter, the Corinthians were going and having the Lord's Supper in a very selfish way. The rich were kind of flaunting their wealth. They would bring uh, plenty of food and drink, I guess you could say, to the Lord's table. And Paul laments that some people left hungry because you would go first come, first served kind of a thing. And, and some people would leave hungry and other people would leave drunk. Like some had too much and some didn't get anything. And there wasn't this fellowship, there wasn't this community of believers going on there. And it's important, I mentioned this with proclaiming the Lord's death, because Paul comes so clearly around to the purpose. You want to know what you actually communicate to one another? Put aside your, your selfish communication you have a proclamation on your lips that you're making. This is the joy of believer is that when I take the Lord's Supper, there's not, there's, there is something that Jesus tells me here, and that's wonderful. But I, I'm proclaiming to my brothers and sisters, and they're proclaiming to me. And that's really special. I get to proclaim the Lord's death. Um, it's, it's especially because of the meaning and significance of the Lord's Supper, that Luther, that Paul can say this. Um, you proclaim the Lord's death. This is so all about what happened for us on the cross. I preach that sermon. Every time I get up and I'm saying to my brothers and sisters, I believe he died for me. That's why I'm going to go and partake of the sacrament. Because this bread and this wine is soul food that nourishes me with the forgiveness of sins because it's not just any bread and wine. It's Jesus' body and it's his blood given and shed for me on the cross. And that's my sermon to you. This is my faith. And I get to proclaim that to you by going and you proclaim it that that's your faith too by going. It's awesome. Other truths or comments, Jared? It's a new covenant. This is a weird way of talking, sort of like saying, Jesus saying, I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, Jesus, are you saying you're a thing? No, he's not the thing. He's the means for that thing. So this cup is the new covenant, is a way of saying, this cup is the means whereby you share in a relationship with God. A covenant is this, you know, this covenant between us. <laughs> it's a relationship word. So this cup is, is the is that means whereby you are sharing in this relationship with me. It is my death on the cross that you have a relationship with God. It is this relationship covenant word um, brought about by my blood. Go ahead. Yeah, um, Jared is saying that usually in a covenant, you're, you're sitting down, there's two parties at the table. So you think of one party agrees to this, the other party agrees to that, and you both walk away. This is largely a one-sided covenant. God has established the terms for this. He has set out the payment price, and he's even given it and furnished it himself. This is the most gift of a covenant that you could ever have received. And yet, in light of even the sermon today, um, God who gets down on his hands and knees and picks out the stones and does everything in this covenant for the vine, um, then, he's, then I go in my thanksgiving. I guess I don't really have a part like that I contribute to the covenant, but I will reflect the covenant in my thankful living. 
I will reflect that I've been covenanted with the Lord by His grace and mercy alone through Jesus. Um, and now I'm going to live this way and say my after communion prayer, um, or you know, which we do in worship together. Um, strengthen us with this heavenly food. <laughs> and we might not sin anymore. We don't want to sin, Lord. We're your people. Yeah, you have a new, a new era, um, this new covenant in my blood. You have an era of, of fulfillment. And Jesus knows that this is something already begun. Even though this is the night he was betrayed, the things are all set in motion. Well, they had been from eternity. But in a special way, all of the things he was about to usher in, the day of fulfillment, um, the covenant that's in his blood established. Good point. Please. Is it new, uh, new covenant terminology that also or get the last will and testament idea, or that's um, I don't know. He asked if the new covenant terminology is also where we get the last will and testament idea. I I always traced last will and testament to the fact of like when Jesus says. Um, you think of this like this legacy of him leaving us with the forgiveness of sins and he, I mean he has done this with the sacraments but especially this ongoing way of the Lord's Supper and and having it take place the night before he dies it gets that kind of treatment that's that's the only connection I've made anything else please Kathy lots of hands sorry that's great There is, a, in a covenant, there is relational promises. You, you've got a relationship and you have something gets put on the table and we walk away and there's an agreement there, there's an understanding that, that something has authority, uh, there's an authority present on the table. With this covenant, there's a, a promise, there's an oath, right? So there is a promise. This is the gospel promise. This is Jesus saying, I did this. It's good news. It's for you. Um, this is filled with authoritative, never-to-be-changed-or-altered kind of language. Please, John. It's the gospel. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's this the cross. This is the cross. It's the good news for the sinner. I, one point that I like was the receive from the Lord just right at the beginning that this isn't a tradition that the church started at some point. It was started by Jesus. Yeah, great to highlight. I received this from the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. So there are two covenants, you know, and we are replacing the covenant of under Moses um, with the gospel covenant. And in a sense, what does Paul say? The, the covenant started with Abraham. And that was out of the blue. It was by grace. You always had two covenants in the Old Testament. That's why it gets so confusing. But you always have two covenants because you have the, the, Noah, the Noah type, the Abraham type covenant, where it's sheer promise of God. And then you have a special, I'm going to treat you like a teenager or a child. You know, and I'm going to raise you up in what it's like to have a relationship with me. And that includes threats and punishments and kind of consequences. A two-sided, I do this, you do that. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to be your babysitter for a while. And now we are in the full time, the fullness of time, when the time had fully come in the era of Christ. But to say this is not a church tradition. This is straight from Jesus. I've received this from the Lord. Paul makes that richly clear. Jill? Right. It's on the night he was betrayed. Um, Jesus did this. There's, here is the, the blessing and the victory of God. 
in the midst of the worst actions and sins. And what a lesson for us that is. Um, so often we, we shy away from weakness. We were just talking about this at Mom's group on Friday. We shy away from, you know, the things that are lowly, even though this is where God's strength is. Um, one of the often abused quotes of Luther is, sin boldly, if you've heard that one before, when you sin. Or what he means is your view of your sin. Don't, don't step around. You know how we want to get so defensive? Oh, that wasn't sin. That wasn't sin. You know, here's, on the night he was betrayed. And Jesus is not... He's not fearful of it. He's not intimidated by the circumstances. He knows exactly where this is going. And for Luther, the, the Christian, when you confess your sins, let it be full. Let's not hide. Let's not soft tuddle. Let's, you know what? I, I did kind of sin like this, but I probably didn't sin in my attitude. Or I might have sinned like this, but I probably didn't. You know, it's kind of, it's probably a little less like, no, sin, but let it be big. Let your confession say, you know what? It was all, it's all unworthy of your praise, Lord. But here I am, and here is Christ that you've given to me. Um, have mercy on me for his sake. And it's, uh, that's kind of a sin boldly. Don't call it not sin. That is very dangerous to your soul. Don't say you're not sinning. <laughs> if we claim to be without sin, you see how the liturgy is just trying to help us along and walk you through it? We deceive ourselves. Don't live in illusion. Better to sin boldly than live an illusion. That's, doesn't that sound like Luther? <laughs> Don't live a lie. Beautiful. Uh, let's look at a couple of the next verses. This is, or, this is awesome. Verse 27. So then, now he's reviewed the words of institution, and now here we go to some special teaching on how we um, handle the, the Lord's Supper. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. Write down some truths. Okay, share some truths. So let me get us started. Please, Bob. When we uh, participate in communion, it's important that we discern that we're partaking of the body and blood of Christ. Okay, so this is the when we take the Lord's Supper, we uh, it's important to discern it because of the blessings that are offered there are to be received by faith. So um, we examine ourselves. I'm going to sin boldly in a sense where I am not going to hold back, but I know what I need and I know what Jesus is giving in the Lord's Supper. So there's an examining that takes place um, that, that this is like at the heart of our faith, our Christianity. Good point. Others. Kathy. Um, 
Yeah, say that first part again. When we examine ourselves, then we are looking to determine whether or not we are worthy at that point in time to receive hope. Okay. So the self-examination is looking at um, it's looking at my standing before God, you know, without Jesus, or I'm examining myself and my ways. I know that I, there is no such thing as a, um, a worthy recipient, in a sense. The only worthiness is people who need it, is <laughs> the sinner. You, you need sinners who need the Lord's Supper, looking to Jesus for forgiveness. Um, that examination becomes important. Others, Joanne. Okay, great point. On the contrary, somebody who does not believe this is Jesus' body and blood and does not believe he is the Savior for forgiveness of sins, in, in other words, there is some education that goes along or learning about what is this Lord's Supper that takes place first. Otherwise, you do take it to your harm. You don't just receive the blessings um, by going through the motions or something like that. Um, you can take, you will take Jesus' body and blood, and it's not like, oh, for you that was just bread. You take Jesus' body and blood as, some, as that which judges you, um, in a sense. It take, you take it to your spiritual harm and not your spiritual good. So there is an important reason to find out what somebody's confession of faith is and for them to find out what ours is before we take communion in a, in a church together. Um, not that we're doing like an inquisition, and, but we are to be responsible to say, you know, what do you believe? And you need to hear what we believe so that we can find ourselves on the same uh, page. Bob. Prepared, you know, prepare yourself. And I remember when I, <coughs> excuse me, when I grew up, you, you went to uh, Friday night, you went to the pastor, and what we do now register, you know, for communion, but you prepared yourself more than you went, almost like a confession in a way, you know. And, and you know, I think we kind of gotten away from that. Yeah, the, yeah there, there is often a, tr a tradition of um, coming on a Friday to see the pastor before a communion Sunday or to do basically confession and absolution or register for communion. Um, now that's been incorporated into the worship service in a sense we have corporate confession and absolution every time we have a uh, Lord's Supper communion service. One of the things I also notice is what is Paul's body and I sin against his blood but it still becomes it still remains um, bread and cup uh, as well so you think of the four things that's what we teach in the real presence that, that Jesus' body and blood are truly there, truly present, really real presence, and, uh, and so is the bread and wine. We use these, these prepositions that we kind of pile up to, to make it a full confession and say, in, with, and under, that Christ's body and blood are in, with, and under the bread and the wine. A Catholic may say under, like they say, you know, the, the bread is just the appearance, but it has changed its substance to be the body. <laughs> so they might agree with the under part, but not really the with and the in. Um, and so the with word is really one that says all four things are present um, in the Lord's Supper, in, with, and under. So we pile up the prepositions to be specific about the real presence. Please, Kathy. happens in the Mass or the liturgy, whatever, the beginning of that is, and ask the Holy Spirit to change. Jesus didn't ask the Holy Spirit to come down. It's just not, it's, it mm. really is an error. Yeah. The transubstantiation, when, when that happens in the service, they have a prayer for the Holy Spirit to come and change. I didn't know that. Yes. To come and change um, the bread and wine to the body and blood of our Lord. Uh, the formula of Concord, if you are curious and want to read more, Article 7 has plenty for you to chew on 
um, and review this. Uh, and I've, I have it open as backup in case something got dicey today, but you know, um, <laughs> this is really fun. Any other truths that you see there? Judgment on themselves, unworthy manner. Please, Jerome. It's not there, but I think it's interesting that even before the institution of the Lord's Supper, this idea was a stumbling block. Early in, in the book of John, you have people turning away from Jesus after he says, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you'll have no part of me. Okay. So this, is, this, is, this has been there for... Yeah, I'm glad you brought up John 6. John 6 has that um, great I am the bread of life discourse and Jesus saying, unless you eat my flesh, you know, and you have no part with me kind of a thing. Um, and there, there it was divisive. There were many people that left him on that account because he was drawing attention to himself. We will say, I guess in a doctrinal way, that John 6 is not talking about the Lord's Supper are not really in view yet. So we don't read the Lord's Supper into John chapter 6 when Jesus says, I'm the bread of the life, uh, of, I'm the bread of life, he's talking about the Lord's Supper. No, he's really talking about um, faith is that narrow. It's narrowed down to one Savior, that it's that confined to his person that was offensive to them. And standing in the full role of being the Messiah that was troublesome to people that this was this was the son of god before their eyes and they stumbled on that rather than him being a great prophet or somebody to listen to or kind of be that kind of disciple now this is i worship you we worship you you know unless you fully this me i'm the bread unless you eat this all of this is me nobody else you have do not have the kingdom of heaven or, or eternal life. That was huge for Jesus, but not necessarily the Lord's Supper. But it has been, um, it has been tied in the past. It's good to bring that up. Let's look at the Luther quotes. Um, I know we're, we're running low. I can never tell if that, which hand is longer from this distance. I think I've got five minutes. That's so what I'd like you to do is... Um, I'll, let me assign you a quote at your table, and you can just read and react to it at your tables. So A and B, Nancy and David, C, D, E, and then we can start over. A, B, C, D, E. Did you catch that? A, B. Read your paragraph and discuss. Okay, sorry, we don't have a lot of time for that. We are going to close with our prayer.
I guess I gotta get through these slides. 29. There we are. Um, I just, I think you can always appreciate how forcefully and clearly Luther's paragraphs, and you can read the others on your own, he's, he always finds a, a way to make his point and make his point clear to people. Uh, and that is still a precious thing for us today. Keep reviewing these teachings about the Lord's Supper for your own comfort and for your own enjoyment of the sacrament, but also as you talk to other people about it, encourage them too. Let's close with this prayer. Pray it with me. Lord Jesus Christ, I receive your supper, and yet I go on without bearing fruit as before. I regret that I have received this great treasure only to let it be dormant within me. Since you have given this blessing to me, may it so change my life that I will show kindness to my fellow men. Help us by your Holy Spirit to thank you from the heart for this sacrament and to use it worthily to our salvation. Amen. Your day, and uh, we are fast approaching all our fun Reformation celebration stuff this month. So this is a fun way to do it.